Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Surge Podcast. So, uh, first, thank you all for the excellent feedback. Um, secondly, um, I've received initially I received like one email telling me to try and shorten it down, and then um, I received a, a couple of other questions and comments and stuff on Twitter. And I think um, you know there there's a lot of stuff in ventilation, and I kind of tried to skim through it, and but an hour and a half maybe podcast isn't the best medium for this stuff but I think that it's it's at least a primer that I was hoping to give out and like I said eventually I'm going to figure out a way to get the slides up as well I just don't know how to do it with my current pod host um, so just going back over things uh, there were two key points the first was that people genuinely wanted to try and figure out an approach for when they're called at 2 a.m. And the second was that there were certain people in certain centers where these patients were being put on regular wards. By regular wards, I mean like internal medicine day surgery wards. Or, uh, sorry, day surgery wards or internal medicine sort of uh, day hospital wards or places like that that were definitely not comfortable with this and with limited amount of expertise, even by the attending physician that's supposed to be staffing that area. And, you know... Uh, a, that's, that's why we started this talk um, and in many ways why we've taken this direction, the podcast. But B, I think that it's extremely valid that you're asking these questions and, and, and it's extremely safe. And all the questions amount to one big thing and, and it's, it's, it's in the show notes and it's in the description of the podcast. And that is, what should you do at 2 a.m. when you get the phone call at 2 a.m.? And I'm, trying, I'm gonna try and do like a redux algorithm for what you can do at 2 a.m. to try and solve the problem or what you can do when when the main ICU guys are busy to try and, and get through it and you know I, I'd say that this is white belt to sort of half asleep anxious blue belt level when they're you're getting the phone call on it's basically troubleshooting ventilators I, I go through a whole different bigger talk uh, when I get the crash courses in person but you know it's basically that and I'm going to go through the easiest way to think about it, which is the SOAP approach. Uh, first, look for secretions that may be excessive. Get the patient to try and clear them and suction them. Uh, the second is uh, to make sure that they're adequately oxygenated and perform specific maneuvers that we'll go through for that, such as raising the FiO2 and raising the PEEP like we talked about in the previous episode. The third is to make sure that the airway isn't compromised by either a blocked DT tube or a burst balloon or a positive leak somewhere in the circuit. And the fourth is uh, looking into whether or not the lung is worsening. And that SOAP approach might be the easiest place for you to start as a, an extreme novice, uh, extreme white belt. And then you, you need to calm yourself down afterwards and think about what can go wrong. So the first thing that will go wrong is an alarm. So you'll get a phone call and they'll say, there's an alarm, I don't know what to do about it. And those alarms are based on the triggers that we talked about the last time. The second thing that you might get asked about is a desaturation, is desatting. The third is to get a phone call with the blood gas read to you over the phone. And in general, we talked about this, there are only two big respiratory problems that a ventilator can fix, an oxygenation problem or a ventilation problem. For oxygenation, the augmentation is in the PEEP or in the FiO2 and the side effects are bowel trauma or free radical formation. For the uh, ventilation problem, it's an increase in minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is the tidal volume, which is the regular breathing volume times the rate. It's how many liters you ventilate per minute. Or uh, the, the second component of it would be uh, the driving pressure or the uh, inspiratory pressure and the PEEP combined. And yes, you can call it the pressure support and PEEP if you want to. And those things have to be contended with. The third one is a higher metabolic rate, which, you know, complete sedation for the patient and cooling may be a potential viable option, although I doubt that it really works, right? It's an increased work of breathing. From the outset, quick disclaimer, we're not going to be talking about when to prone a patient. If your patient is so sick that they're in ARDS mode, it's a different discussion. I'm talking about, like, regular plateaued vanilla patient where they're responsive to therapy and now they've conked out at 2 a.m., Right. When you're working things up, uh, wearing your internal medicine hat, 
Um, you'd probably want to think, is this a block DT tube from a mucus plug? Is this an air leak? Is this a pneumothorax slash air leak? Uh, is this atelectasis? Or is it that the patient is not working with the ventilator anymore? And I'm going to spend about 10 minutes of this 20 minute talk talking about patient ventilator dyssynchrony. Because you can write a whole book about it, but what you can do at 2 a.m. is about 10 lines. Okay? For you to get a complete differential figured out, your investigations have to happen. Now, one of the concepts that I talk about later on is the sense of urgency versus the sense of investigation definitive diagnosis. And I might do a talk about that later when, when things are a little bit less COVID and we don't need more succinct information. But for now, let's talk about the basic concept. So your ability to investigate and come up with a differential and the resolution of the data that you get goes down with urgency. The more urgent the situation, the less time you have to investigate and confirm your diagnosis. And so the first thing to look at is the monitor in the most urgent of situations. This will tell your patient's desaturating or not. If patient's desaturating, it's an oxygenation problem plus or minus a ventilation problem. The second thing to look at is the waveform. The waveform will give you of the plasmophometer for the, for the saturation. The waveform will give you two things. First, the quality of the signal. So is it a technical problem that you're being called for in the actual machine? The machine's not working right. The contact's not working right with the patient, etc. The wire's broken. Or is it a resuscitative problem? Is there a hemodynamic instability? Maybe you should check the blood pressure, have EKG leads on the patient too. And yes, I know that in the States, for the most part, in most ivory tower centers, we have a complete cardiac monitor, but you have to bear in mind, we are dealing with a worldwide crisis in which a lot of us are just working with an oxygen saturation probe that's battery operated and not particularly accurate after a set of 70. That is our reality outside of ivory tower centers. I'm lucky enough to also work in an ivory tower center. And so therefore my reality is different. I'd get very annoyed if a nurse couldn't give me this differential, did not check the monitor's quality, etc. But in other places, if the waveform seems off, it may be a sign of hemodynamic instability. You might want to get a cardiac monitor on the patient. You might want to get the patient to the ICU if they're being ventilated outside of your ICU for whatever reason. The third fastest thing to get is bloods because you're only needing a blood gas. And for the most part, it's going to be a venous blood gas if you're outside the ICU and you're ventilating a patient mechanically invasively outside the ICU. And the last is going to be a chest x-ray. Okay, because that's probably going to take the longest given the technical factors, especially with COVID-19 positive patients. Now, if, if you wanted to look at an algorithm of what goes through my head at 2 a.m., I don't have physiology in my brain. That part of my brain's dead by that point. I have a trigger event, so a reason for me to wake up. And in general, if I were to summarize all trigger events to do with ventilators, it's going to be a worsening respiratory status which leads us to a three-pronged approach that we would like to do in synchrony. The three-pronged approach involves, number one, checking the ventilator circuit and supply, number two, getting better set of vitals and double-checking that your monitor's working correctly, number three is suctioning and checking the ET tube itself, checking that the cuff is not burst. And this is no matter what the alarm is. Like, I do these things right off the bat. I look at the monitor, make sure that the waveform is accurate, everything is accurate on there. I check the circuit itself while they're setting up a suction for me. I do a sterile suction inside the ET tube and I check the BP, the BP tube's um, guidance balloon. Okay. Afterwards, I order a chest x-ray and a blood gas. And depending on how low the saturation is and what the patient looks like clinically, I'll consider a recruiting recruitment maneuver, which we'll go through in a second. While I'm waiting for the blood gas and the chest x-ray, there are three possible pathologies at this point. The first is a mucus plug or a collapsed lung. The recruitment maneuver may help with that. The suction may help with that. The second is a pneumothorax. The recruitment maneuver may cause that and may worsen it. So be cognizant of that and make sure that you auscultate the lung or do an EFAST, looking at the lung fields on ultrasound, before you attempt a recruitment maneuver. The third one is a worsening of the chest x-ray with the underlying pathologies. For example, increase in consolidation, newly formed diffusion. Newly formed diffusion, if it's big enough to cause this, you might want to think it's a hemothorax, particularly if you put in a central line recently. Otherwise, I'd take it with a grain of salt that that's the cause, right? I'd actually look to make sure that it's not lung collapse. 
collapsed lung can be treated with a suction, recruitment maneuver, and bronchoscopy, as we said. Now, worsening chest x-ray is your biggest problem. If it's an ARDS or ARDS-like pathology, like COVID-19, for example, at the point in which they're being intubated, you might want to work on ARGENET protocol, raise the PEEP and the FIO2, and start thinking about adjuncts and maybe transfer them to a higher level of care. So if this patient's mechanically ventilated outside the ICU on an invasive ventilator, you might want to swap them with a less sick patient, potentially, okay? If you have a hemodynamic st instability involved with this situation, it's even worse, right? Because now you're dealing with double organ failure. Now, the concept of recruitment. My personal preference in our protocol, in our ICU, is a 40 for 40, which is basically setting the airway pressure to 40 centimeters of H2O for 40 seconds. And the way that I do that is I bring up the peep and I do a, a hold, okay, uh, on it. And that brings up the airway pressure, okay? The other way that you can do it is set to pressure support and do an inspiratory hold. The third way is to uh, bring up the peep all the way up and then titrate it down over time in two centimeter increments. I prefer this method because uh, I'm paranoid and I find that, that, you know, 40 for 40 has had a good response and doesn't blow a pneumo. It's anecdotal, all right? The Antobin protocol, which is this protocol, is just as good. Um, I have no biopsies to prove that it works or it doesn't or causes more power trauma, but it just doesn't look right to me. I'm sorry. I, I like everything else that Jan Tobin says, but no, right? Now, patient ventilator dyssynchrony. Patient ventilator dyssynchrony is when the patient's demand is not met by the ventilator and they're angry, basically. They're fighting the vent, for lack of a better term. Now, it could be an inspiratory timing problem, in which case you want to deal with the IE ratios. It could be a flow-related problem. It could be a demand problem for air hunger, so the patient's sucking air, and you might want to augment your pressure. Or it could be the duration of inspiration, okay? The best way of dealing with it is uh, to have the patient have partial control. So first, don't use a totally controlled mode. Very few ventilators will let you give a totally controlled mode at this point. Most of them are assist control ventilators at this point, and most in-hospital protocols work on assist control. Second, look at the patient. So this isn't something that you can fix with a chest x-ray. Uh, you need to look and see, are they having a problem with their way that they're breathing in, the way that they're breathing out, or the way that the air is being shoved in? And act accordingly. If all else fails, take over their breathing, sedate them, dare I say it, paralyze them, give them tennis sucks, and let them work their way back around, okay? The IE ratio will tend to help them if it's pan cycle, if it's happening during inspiration, expiration. Usually it's an IE ratio hunger problem. Uh, if it's happening at the beginning of the cycle, it's slightly different. And sometimes, very rarely, I find that it's a trigger problem. So the patient's just not, not happy with the fact that they're triggering it so much. Sometimes it's not the patient's fault. Sometimes there's water in the circuit and that causes the trigger. The circuit's gunked up. And sometimes it's because the, the patient sucks and so it, it causes like a double triggering phenomenon. Sometimes because they hiccup. Sometimes it's the heart itself, especially if they're on vasopressors or ionotropes, right? And or the trigger sensitivity is too low. So you need to look at those things as well. And effectively, if all else fails and it's 2 a.m., it's not justifiable, but you may have to just say, I'm going to take over the patient's breathing and just put on full assessment and paralyze them and sedate them for like half an hour until they come back again, right? In summary, address ventilator factors, rule out circuit factors, and take over the work of breathing and consider sedation or comfort. And remember, the causes for failed extubation also count here. So look for things like fluid overload, decreased level of consciousness, agitation, upper airway weakness, increased secretions, and respiratory failure. Let me know if you have any questions. Please email me at any point. Thank you for listening, and I tried to make this a little bit more brief. And for you guys who are panicking right now and who are very, a little bit worried about what's going on, my own anxiety levels have been coming up recently. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to acute care. It's just that... Uh, the flow and the news and, and, and the, the constant drip of bad news is just, it, it does take a toll, I agree with you. You know, stay strong and remember, if Chuck Norris can do it, you can, A, and B, we're built for this. When you were in medical school, I sincerely doubt that you went to medical school 
to not do this stuff, right? Acute care is the reason why we went to medical school. We're built for this stuff. If you're listening to this podcast, this is the easiest day in your life, right? This is what you live for. So keep it up, march forward, and listen, everybody's having a worse time than you are because you're trained to do this. Have a good day. Please subscribe and let me know what you think. Keep that feedback coming.